Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. While so many Hollywood actors made the big switch to Europe to revive their dying careers, not all enjoyed the success they craved. The exquisitely muscled Lex Barker did the same and reached success he never thought he could have. However, what lay at the back of Lex's mind was to conquer the elusive Hollywood. Is Lex Barker the best Tarzan ever? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. You'd hear tales of actors choosing a path in acting because of poverty. Lex Barker is a different breed. With a background fully steeped in wealth and nobility, one would think his future career would be a white-collar job, and he would build a big house, a beautiful wife, and maybe children. The tall, chiselled actor Lex Barker would get some of these things, but not with the career people would have predicted he would have. He would marry five times, and he married exquisite women. One of his wives was a Hollywood star, but Hollywood relationships have a way of getting destroyed. Another of his wives was a beauty queen. Alas, beauty wasn't enough to tie the macho Lex down. True, he divorced a lot, and we tell you this, not all those divorces were peaceful. One divorce began with Lex being under gunpoint because he did something Tarzan wouldn't even do. Hollywood cherished good looks and manly men, but Lex Barker was too much for Hollywood. He was too tall, standing at six foot four inches, and physically imposing, which made the roles he could appear in limited in a way. Although he had a face that radiated beauty and dirty blonde hair, but added a certain grit to his look, strong man Lex created difficult circumstances for studio bosses. He had a physique that screamed the main role, but didn't have the corresponding fame to go with the physique. Interestingly, studio execs weren't willing to experiment with his acceptance as a lead actor with the audience. They had made their bankable box office stars and taking a chance on a man that didn't have the ready-made fame that brought money didn't look exciting. Well, their loss. Providence shone on Lex, that twist of fate that helped Hollywood stars pop out after spending so long in the shadows befell Lex, and as a go-getter he grabbed the opportunity with both of his powerful hands. Providence came in the form of producer Sol Lesser, who wanted to please his wife. While pleading for Lex's consent as the newest Tarzan, he would say, For the sake of my wife. Sol Lesser was convinced that he had found the next person to play Tarzan when he saw Barker's commanding physique. Even Edgar Rice Burroughs, the author of the Tarzan series, believed he had finally found the person who would play the character as he envisioned in his mind. Yes, Barker wasn't selected on the basis of Bass acting skills, but how buff he looked! While on another day, Barker, who actually took lessons in acting, might have been offended by what appeared to be a disregard for his talent, at that time it didn't matter. The chiselled actor needed a big break, and he got it. Although Barker would come to almost hate that opportunity, as it created periods of embarrassment for him, ah, 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 the fans would demand him to shriek when they see him in public. As the successor to Johnny Weissmuller, as the newest actor of Tarzan at the time, they felt he had to show his Tarzan-ness at every opportunity continually. Filling the boots of Johnny Weissmuller was no mean feat, but Lex did it masterfully, and you can imagine the relief of the bosses at RKO Pictures. Audiences went wild at this new Tarzan, and it culminated in embarrassing demands for Barker. Without being prejudicial to Weissmuller, Lex may have surpassed him as Tarzan, as the way Lex interpreted his role is closer to the books. Plus, despite only doing five films, Lex brought success to the films which matched Weissmuller's success. Tarzan's Magic Fountain, which came out in 1949, was Barker's introduction to the series, and apart from audience approval, critics also approved of his performance. The reviews were positive, well, mostly positive. Some reviews were not so positive. A New York Times reviewer said, A younger, more streamlined ape-man with a personable grin and a torso guaranteed to make any lion cringe. They praised Barker's freshness, but the film was a matter of stale peanuts at the same old jungle stand. 
The next film on the Tarzan production wheel for Barker was Tarzan and the Slave Girl, released just a year after Barker's first Tarzan film in 1950, and Lee Sholem directed it. The next year, Byron Haskins and Phil Brandon's Tarzan's Peril came out, and it was different from previous releases as part of the film was shot in Africa. Barker became even more popular, but was already the Tarzan guy, and he didn't like this much. He was oozing with talent, and he felt he was more dynamic than what Hollywood was offering. This ambition cut short his reign as Tarzan, as he and producer Sol Lesser would constantly argue about his ambitions. The conflict was so great that Sol Lesser ensured that a significant portion of Lex's line was cut for the last Tarzan film in which Barker acted, Tarzan and the She-Devil. Despite this malicious act, Barker had the last laugh as the film was a great success at the box office, cementing Barker's legacy as Tarzan, but effectively typecasting him. When filmmakers saw Lex, they saw The Jungle Guy, and after sticking around Hollywood hoping to get the recognition of his talent, as he felt he deserved, Lex left Hollywood. He was to them the ape man and nothing more. Although few opportunities came his way, he never got an opportunity to be the centre of a picture. Perhaps Sol Lesser was behind the opportunity restriction. We'd never know. Some producers are notorious for trying to ruin the careers of actors who had a different viewpoint, but Sol didn't seem that way. It would appear that Lex was a victim of his own success and himself. His body made people view him in certain roles, while Lex wanted to be more. Hollywood can be cruel at times, and Lex felt its cruelty because his talent wasn't enough to give him the accolades he deserved. Popularly known as the tenth actor to play Tarzan in Hollywood, Lex Barker has come a long way since then, but he had to make sacrifices to become an actor worthy of note. Barker was born as Alexander Critchlow Barker Jr. in 1919, the second child of the wealthy Alexander Critchlow Barker Sr., a Canadian-born building contractor turned stockbroker, and Marion Thornton Beals. He belonged to the favoured upper class of society not only by virtue of his parents' wealth, but noble heritage. His direct ancestor was Roger Williams, who founded Rhode Island, and Sir William Henry Critchlow, the Governor-General of Barbados in the era of swashbuckling pirates. Barker grew up in New York, where his parents enrolled him in Fessenden School and Phillips Exeter Academy. In school, he established himself as the ultimate sportsman as he excelled in swimming, track, football, tennis, fencing, track, and athletics. Despite being the man-machine, Lex had an artistic side. He played the oboe. The luxurious education didn't end there. The athletic actor would also attend the prestigious Princeton University, where he took up acting classes, but as fate would have it, Barker felt a college education was not for him. He dropped out and became a member of a theatrical company. His decision didn't please anyone in his family. The man from a prestigious family was choosing to abandon the education that would have secured him felt scandalous to his parents. Finding success as an actor wasn't easy for Lex, but he didn't quit. It was his dream, and he would see it to the end. He began his career in 1938 on Broadway as he got a small part in The Merry Wives of Windsor, based on Shakespeare's works. The show had a brief run on Broadway, and compared to his second small role on a Broadway show, it was a relatively long run. Barker would appear in Disastrous Five Kings by Orson Welles, whose run was met with different forms of disasters, one being the show never got to New York due to issues it had in Boston and Philadelphia, he would later appear on Hollywood's radar while working in that summer stock theatre. The representatives of 20th Century Fox saw him and offered him a contract. Without really making a mark in Hollywood, yet with bits and pieces roles he got, Uncle Sam needed him, and in 1941, before the Pearl Harbor attack, he enlisted in the United States Army as an infantry private, but he rose through the ranks and became a major during his period of service. In Italy, Barker stared death in the face as he got injured in the head and leg, but he survived. However, he had to get a silver plate implanted in his temple. The noble warrior was sent to the United States for recovery at the Arkansas Military Hospital, and as he was discharged from service, he resumed the pursuit of his acting career. 
He would quickly land another small role in Dollface, 1945, which was his first film. Then in 1947 he had notable small roles in Potter's The Farmer's Daughter or Dimitrix Crossfire, and perhaps the most notable in Western Return of the Bad Men in 1948. Shortly after, Tarzan came along and Lex did his absolute best portraying the role, and he attained success with the role but also had boxed himself in with it. Although while he was still playing his Tarzan role, he got to play lead in the 1952 film Battles of the Chief Pontiac, which was a Western film that respectfully and intelligently portrayed Indians, the audience was not in for such a film. They just wanted to hear that Tarzan yell. After leaving the Tarzan role, Lex got a part in Randolph Scott's Western film Thunder Over the Plains in 1953, where Lex showed he had all it took to act in Western genres. He got what he wanted, and he got lead roles in different Western films, although at this point it helped that it was Universal Studios that he was contracted to. Lex impressed with his performance as a gold prospector in the 1954 movie Yellow Mountain, and as if that performance wasn't surreal enough, Barker surpassed his own limits in The Man from Bitter Ridge, which was released in 1955. Lex has a riveting way of holding the attention of the audience, and he got the acclaim he wanted by acting the role of a complex character so masterfully in the war drama Away All Boats in 1956. Hollywood can be unrewarding. Despite the obvious talent that Lex had shown, he began to struggle to get roles. Barker had already shown that he was an actor with a wide range of skills and not afraid of taking tasking roles. This wasn't all talk, as he took on a tasking role in The Girl in Black Stockings, a psycho thriller, and Deer Slayer, a James Fenimore Cooper's classic in 1957. Despite showing his talent, the doors of Hollywood wouldn't budge any more, and strongman Barker couldn't force his way in. However, he believed he still had much inside and went to England to make a film, before going to Italy, Spain and France. He had a command of different languages, allowing him to blend in in Europe. He could speak French, Italian, Spanish and to an extent German. In Italy, he quickly convinced them of his talent, as when Federico Fellini, an Italian director, cast him in the Italian film La Dolce Vita. He was more than impressed. Although the plot of the film was something sexy Lexi related to, the film was, after all, about a drunken ex-Tarzan actor. While he was enjoying his small success in Italy, fortune came his way in the form of Arta Bronner, a notable German producer, who acknowledged Lexi's talent and introduced him to the German film industry. His introduction to the German industry made his gamble to switch to Europe worth it. Lex would act as an FBI agent in the crime thriller films Return of Dr. Mabus in 1961 and Invisible Dr. Mabus in 1962. In the film Thrawn Arts, Dr. Sibelius, Lex would then portray a doctor. Germany gave Lex the satisfaction of exploring the depths of his acting prowess. It also gave him a role that would also stereotype him again. This role came in the form of 12 German Western films based on the works of German author Karl May. He would play Old Shatterhand and partner with Pierre Bryce, who would play the role of Old Shatterhand's blood brother. Interestingly, he got an advantage over other actors for the role due to his body and athleticism. The film's producer wanted Lex for the role because he was the closest to the author's vision when writing the character. According to the producer Horst Wendland, Barker looked German than all Germans, with his powerful physique and dirty blonde hair. Initially, Barker refused the role. He said, A German Western? That will not do anything. Wild West adventures have been in Hollywood for 60 years. They are the best specialists. His wife at the time, Irene Lebhart, begged him to reconsider and convinced him to accept. Thankfully he did and would become the actor that would steal the hearts of the audience. He played Old Shatterhand seven times and in the first Old Shatterhand film, The Treasure in the Silver Lake, a record 17 million people trooped to cinemas to watch him. The brawny actor would later win the Best Foreign Actor in the 1966 Bambi Awards. He also played other characters based on Carl May's works. He played Karen Ben-Nemsey and Dr. Carl Sternow, 
As he was bored with Tarzan, so did he come to be bored with his role as Shatterhand, but he had the success he never imagined, and there came other roles that also tested him and allowed him to see more of the world. Already the Shatterhand films had acquainted him with the terrains of Yugoslavia. Barker acted as a private detective in the 1965 film Code 7, Victim 5, where Lex would find himself investigating a series of murders in South Africa. He tapped into his Western persona in grittier Westerns such as A Place Called Glory and La Ballada de Johnny Ringo in 1966. Fans remember A Place Called Glory for its gun-slinging action and La Ballada de Johnny Ringo for their beloved American playing the role of a villain. More films came to Lex in 1966. Lex would become the German version of James Bond in the film Die Slowly, You'll Enjoy It More. The American actor was certainly enjoying the roles he got and the money he made. The European box office king in 1967 would collaborate with director Vittoria De Sica in one of the seven-part American films, Woman Times Seven, which was the only American film he would appear in in the 60s. Lex also explored the horror genre when he acted in the 1967 film Blood Demon, which was a cinematic adaptation of Edgar Allan Poe's book The Pit and the Pendulum. In 1970, he acted in the German film When You Are With Me, and this drew the curtains on his European career. His European success would come to an end as in the 70s he struggled to get roles. So, feeling fulfilled having conquered the European market, Lex returned to Hollywood in 73, where fortune seemed to smile upon him as he quickly landed roles in television films, but sadly for him, none of this materialised to give him an extended run of fame. His long ambition of becoming something more than Tarzan in Hollywood ended as he died on the street, clutching his chest as he was going on a date with his fiancée. Lex may have regrets, but it's certain that he got the success he wanted as an actor. Curtains, old Shatterhand. Curtains. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Actors like Lex Barker were able to convince the directors of the role right away with their physicality. So why Charlton Heston attacked his film director? Let's find out from this video.